and welcome to Banco Santander U.S. headquarters. Let me start by congratulating the Foreign Policy Association for convening a timely conference. With a global economic crisis, the challenges to realizing the UN Millennium Development Goals are acute. In times of economic distress, human rights are not always on the front burner. A few administrations ago, under President Jimmy Carter, <coughs> human rights were the soul of American foreign policy. And as the Obama administration determines the priority it will assign human rights, it is useful to compare notes with our European allies. The universality of human rights is perhaps the most unambiguous message of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This message was underscored by former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan when he said, human rights are African rights, they're Asian rights, they're European rights, they're American rights. They belong to no government, they are limited to no continent, they are fundamental to mankind itself. It is now my great pleasure to turn the floor over to Ambassador Fernando Valenzuela, who is the head of the delegation of the European Commission in the United Nations. Ambassador Valenzuela has held with great distinction many senior posts in Spain's diplomatic service over a 30-year career. Before coming to New York, he served as political director of the European Commission's External Relations Directorate. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Valenzuela. Thank you very much for these very kind words. Gracias, Gonzalo. Uh, let me start, of course, by thanking the Foreign Policy Association for offering me the opportunity to open this conference, the European Union, Human Rights, and the UN Millennium Development Goals. Uh, indeed, these are subjects very uh, dear to the European Union and uh, very closely interlinked. As we all know, uh, development and human rights are two of the three pillars constituting the foundation of the United Nations. In the same way, it can be said that human rights are part of the European Union's DNA. You cannot understand the European Union if you don't think of it of as a, an entity that is founded on the basis of the respect of human rights, uh, fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law. Uh, but obviously, for the European Union, it is also a fundamental, I would say mandate, because it is in this uh, treaty, to cooperate with developing countries and to try to extend uh, development to other parts of the world. So these two uh, aspects come very uh, easily um, together. Concerning human rights, it is so much fundamental for us that it is the only aspect that absolutely has to be complied with by any candidate to become a member of the EU. All the other things, adaptation to the economy of the, of the EU, uh, adopting what we call the key, so uh, all the rules and regulations and laws that we have adopted along the years, are matters that can be negotiated, adapted in time. Uh, you can negotiate different uh, uh, times, schedules, but certainly you cannot negotiate about compliance with human rights and uh, fundamental freedoms. And that's what we call the Copenhagen uh, criteria. As I said, the EU treaty also sets the objectives of its cooperation with developing countries, the sustainable economic and social development, their smooth and gradual integration into the world economy, and the fight against poverty as a fundamental aspects of the EU foreign activity. Uh, the EU treaty also gives the EU and its member states the obligation to comply with the commitments and objectives approved 
in the context of the major EU UN summits and conferences. This, is, this includes, of course, the Millennium Development Goals, which are the main focus of the EU development policy. This priority devoted uh, to MDGs is the core element of the European Consensus on Development, which in 2005 created the overarching policy framework for the development policies of both the EU as such and its member states. The Millennium Development Goals themselves are closely intertwined with the empowerment of human beings, notably women and children. This is especially true when we look at some of the Millennium Development Goals, particularly in this case, education and health. In so doing, the Millennium Development Goals make a crucial contribution to progress towards human rights and fundamental freedom. It is also in this context that the EU has made a commitment to collectively devote 0.7% of its gross national product to development aid by 2015. Not only that, but also the EU has adopted some other intermediate targets and more specifically to, uh, to reach 0.56% of the uh, GDP, uh, GNP, sorry, by 2010. I have to say that these were objectives that were established by the EU before enlargement. And although some of the new member states were still and are still uh, in countries that are under no obligation to contribute to development aid, on the contrary, that could be recipients of development aid, the EU did not modify this commitment and uh, still holds to its commitment of devoting 0.7% by 2015 and 056 by 2010. Yet today, progress towards the MDGs is under threat. Yes, obviously, we have a convergence of crises as probably never before, at least not before for many, many decades. And the financial and economic crisis on the one hand, but before that was the energy and food crisis and the threat of climate change with all that it implies in terms of costs for the economy and also of um, challenges to uh, what we have to, to, uh, will have to do in the near future are aspects that somehow put at risk our ability to uh, achieve the Millennium Development Goals. But for that reason, we have to, I think, reinforce our commitment and press ahead with our objectives. This is something which is actually effective in real uh, life and practice. From 2000, the year 2000 to the year 2005, 120 million people, 120 million people were lifted out of poverty. But still, there are 1.4 billion people living on less than $1.25 a day. So we cannot allow us any margins, any leeway. We cannot backtrack in any way. And this is why it is absolutely fundamental that even under the present conditions of crisis, we actually maintain uh, our uh, commitments. The road ahead is uh, fraught with difficulties. Obviously, these times of crisis are not also the best ones to promote and impulse the respect for human rights and freedoms and um, rule of law. But we have to do it. We have to look at these as something which are not alternative objectives, but are objectives which are completely conditional one upon another. If we, don't, uh, if we are not able to comply and to achieve one of them, we are not going to be able to achieve um, the others. I'm sure that uh, you are going to be discussing all these issues in depth during the panels today. And uh, for that reason, I don't want to take more of your time. I want to leave the floor now for the first panelists, but uh, not without, of course, thanking you for your attention and uh, not uh, without wishing our panelists a fruitful discussion with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Valenzuela, and you have uh, gotten us off to a great start. I'm Noel Latif, President of the Foreign Policy Association, and I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And I cannot think of a more qualified group of speakers to uh, 
address the extraordinary challenges uh, that the world is facing in conferring meaning upon human rights and in making progress towards achieving the UN Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the failure to make headway in meeting basic human needs for millions of people around the world uh, has significant implications for world peace and stability. It gives me great pleasure now to invite our first panel up, and uh, I'd like to, I know that uh, Michael Reisman is too modest to say anything about himself, so I'm just going to say a few words about the chair of our panel. Uh, Michael is um, one of the giants of international law. He is the Myers McDougall Professor of International Law at Yale Law School. He has authored over 22 books and uh, more than 270 articles. At great personal sacrifice, uh, Michael was president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights of the Organization of American States. I am pleased to turn over the proceedings to Michael Reisman and to his very distinguished panel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Noel, for that very generous introduction. I would like to briefly introduce our very distinguished speakers. I will be brief because the issues that we face are very large and challenging, and the expertise of the speakers is uh, quite commensurate with that. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Ambassador Pete de Klerk who I think is filling in for your colleague, Frank Majur. The rumors that uh, Ambassador Majur defected are utterly unfounded. <laughs> uh, Pete de Klerk is the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations, uh, and he's been in that post since 2007. Uh, between 2003 and 2007, he served as the Netherlands ambassador at large for human rights and undertook a large number of bilateral missions and represented the Netherlands in multilateral human rights fora. He has served at the International Atomic Energy Agency and has published widely. Our second speaker, who is quite familiar to audiences at the Foreign Policy Association, is Professor Ed Luck. He's the Senior Vice President and Director of Studies of the International Peace Institute. In February 2008, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed Professor Luck Special Advisor and Assistant Secretary General, uh, in which capacity he primarily focuses on the responsibility to protect, a code word that will be of great importance in our discussion today. Uh, He's had a very distinguished career, and I won't go through all of the details other than to note that he played a key role in United Nations reform from 1995 to 97, and from eight, 1984 to 1994, Dr. Luck served as president and CEO of the United Nations Association of the United States. With those introductions, which barely do justice to our speakers, I would like to invite Pete the Clerk to open the discussion. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's quite a pleasure to be here and to um, address you on the uh, important topic of uh, human rights today, as I understand it, in the context of uh, EU cooperation and in the context of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, that's, that's quite a task. Um, and uh, I will make a, a number of remarks, uh, not too long, because I also believe very much in, in interaction uh, on these important uh, topics. Is there something with the microphone? I don't know. Um, 
We're very lucky that someone finally announced that. We might have proceeded for the whole panel. Um, uh, can I be heard in the back? Very good. Should I repeat what I've said so far? Okay, let me then make a, a few remarks on the topic of, of human rights today. Um, uh, I'm one of those who believe um, that uh, the story of human rights at the United Nations is a great uh, success story. The body of treaties and protocols uh, and institutions that has been built up um, since uh, the Second World War, in my view, is very impressive. Um, and the beginnings of that were um, already constructed before um, the Charter. Um, already in the Atlantic uh, Charter in 1942, this notion of human rights um, that are more than something purely national um, were laid down. And that was quite a departure, departure from um, earlier notions of, of human rights that were basically basic rights, citizen rights in, in different countries. Um, now that body of, of treaties and institutions might be impressive, but at the same time I also fully um, realize that um, there are um, hundreds of millions of people in this world whose rights cannot be realized for quite a number of reasons. So it's a constant task for us, not only for diplomats, but for all of us to um, help realize, help implement um, these um, human rights. The fact that we have treaties at the UN is only the first step, and it's, um, uh, it's member states or states' parties uh, that have undertaken to uh, implement these human rights, and it's a constant task to remind governments that they should do that. Now, fortunately, in these different treaties that we have agreed upon um, since the Second World War, and there's um, nearly ten of those major treaties, um, all of them have uh, in those treaties a mechanism for international uh, cooperation and international interaction that expresses this basic no notion that... Um, implementing human rights is not a purely national affair. This is a task for the international community. So that's one proviso, uh, proviso if you want. Um, the other proviso is that, um, of course, human rights remain a very explosive topic, if you want, um, because there are many states in this world who... Um, have some difficulty with uh, the notion that all their citizens or all the people living in that country have rights. Um, there are many autocratic or dictatorial regimes for whom um, human rights uh, are a threat. Um, and it's a constant struggle also from that perspective to uh, implement internationally human rights. Um, as I said, um, uh, human rights as we know it, um, um, that, that whole body that was constructed, uh, that started um, in and directly after the Second World War, and that's especially true for Europe, um, where uh, one important uh, body that's relevant and that also arose out of the ashes of the World War, of that Second World War, is the Council of Europe that has built up uh, an impressive record um, in terms of, not only in terms of um, treaties um, and, and, and protocols belonging to that treaties, in particular the, the European Treaty on Human Rights, but also have the European Court of Human Rights that has given scores of um, uh, uh, have dealt with scores of cases of violations of human rights that has built up uh, quite a body of law on how to implement human rights. Um, and I know that this is an event that mainly focuses on the European Union, but I wanted to also mention the Council of Europe as a, as a body that is very uh, important um, for, from a human rights perspective. Um, the other important institution, of course, 
in a sense, also very much the result of the Second World War is the European Union. Um, and um, the European Union, um, especially since um, the Treaty of Maastricht, uh, and hopefully not too long from now, the Treaty of Lisbon, um, has coordinated more and more its um, foreign policy, in, particularly, in particular a policy on, on human rights. Um, and um, over the years, um, there has been, uh, has organically grown a common strategy and a large common denominator of what these um, European human rights are. And I say in parentheses, in, in, in quotation marks, because um, um, I attach great value, as, as, as all of us do, to the fact that human rights are universal. Um, so there, there are no separate um, European human rights. There's a separate European human rights policy in trying to implement these um, um, universally agreed um, human rights. I think there's a very large common, common ground with other Western countries, in particular um, the United States. There are also differences. Um, to mention a few, um, there's this... Um, sort of aversion in, in the U.S. to um, economic and social rights, even though uh, from the time that President Roosevelt um, uh, uh, started his or launched his four freedoms, there was freedom from want. So there was this important social economic uh, dimension also from the beginning in, in, in U.S. policy. But over the years, uh, there, the UA, U.S. Uh, remained at a certain distance from uh, economic and social rights, and that's quite a difference from um, European uh, human rights. Um, the other difference is, it's a bit more tricky maybe to say, but um, there are certain um, reflections or reflexes um, of the US as a superpower that has not always respected uh, human rights elsewhere. Um, and in a sense, if you want, Guantanamo is an, is an uh, is a consequence of that. That's the second difference that I would like to mention. And the third difference is that there are a number of peculiarities in in U.S. tradition and U.S. Um, um, U.S. tradition, for example, where it comes to freedom of expression, where you have uh, in the U.S. the First Amendment that makes a makes for quite a difference in how matters of freedom of expression is are looked at in Europe and, and how they are looked at um, in the US, and maybe we can go into that um, later. I just wanted to mention that. But it's maybe the last point I want to make is that um, uh, it would be a grave mistake to um, um, identify human rights with um, the West. I think, uh, as I said before, it's of great importance that um, these um, eight or nine treaties that we have that we have agreed upon in um, UN context, uh, by far the most of them uh, have uh, numbers of signatories between uh, 140 and 190. Um, and um, you can say that they are nearly universally agreed. And I think it's... Um, uh, from a European perspective, it's our task to uh, engage with um, a, a very broad range of countries about implementation of human rights. And um, I mentioned uh, European-EU cooperation before, and I'm glad to note that there is a, an increasing uh, number of dialogues between <coughs> European Union, mostly European Union uh, presidency or, or troika, um, that's the, the, the presidency of the European Union, the future uh, president, presidency and the European Commission and the Council. Um, a growing number of dialogues between that Troika and other countries. And uh, I've participated in quite a number of them uh, uh, at the time of the Netherlands presidency a few years ago. And in my view, that's extremely useful, such a, a, an engagement, um, because there is a very fruitful, constructive dialogue possible between um, the EU and other countries, or sometimes uh, groups of countries. 
a fruitful dialogue that does not always translate into um, our daily activities uh, at the UN, where there's much, um, um, where where you have um, mainly a, a dialogue between blocks or a non-dialogue often, where it's the EU versus uh, the group of 77, and where you have quite often polarized um, positions. Uh, I think this, these dialogues between capitals um, with a broad range of countries are very um, fruitful and constructive to bring the implementation of human rights and, and again, of universally agreed human rights further. And in that sense, I'm very optimistic that um, over the long range, um, this success story of building up a impressive body of human rights can be um, constructed um, further and, and brought further and the implementation uh, furthered and uh, strengthened. Um, and I'm very glad that uh, to, if the title of today is Human Rights Today, um, that, um, that today we had the elections for um, the Human Rights Council. Um, and um, I'm very glad that the United States uh, also decided to engage uh, in this Human Rights Council. It was um, um, chosen uh, to be uh, a member of the um, uh, Human Rights Council for the next couple of years. Um, and I think that um, with the UN, US on board in this important uh, UN body, and we can discuss the, the, the pluses and minuses of that body and, and of UN bodies in general. But I think that uh, with the US on board that uh, we are uh, we will have a, an interesting new period in strengthening um, human rights as of today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and, and uh, thank you, Noel, for having us. It's always enjoyable to be at uh, FBA again. And I think Michael suffered through a panel with me a few years ago, and yet he's come back. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Maybe his memory has failed him, but... Uh, uh, we appreciate a uh, uh, chance to be here again. Um, Ambassador, uh, the clerk is much more organized than I am, and he was commenting to me just as we are coming down here that um, he was hoping we'd both address the same issue and then we could debate. But I said the problem is if we address the same issue, I doubt that we'd have any real differences. Um, I would probably simply echo uh, his sentiments. So. Um, I'm taking a piece of human rights, uh, the responsibility to protect. And I do think it is a piece of the human rights spectrum and shouldn't be thought of as something that's very different. It is unfortunately the most extreme and massive end of human rights violations. Uh, because the responsibility to protect uh, is something that was agreed to by all the heads of state and government uh, in a consensus decision at the 2005 summit. Uh, and they pledged that they would protect their populations uh, from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. The, various, the very things that are the epitome of what we're trying to stop in dealing with human rights so we don't get this kind of massive violence uh, that has racked one part of the world after another. Uh, unfortunately, after agreeing to that, uh, a number of member states, apparently none from the EU, but from different parts of the world, uh, had a collective amnesia about what they had just signed on to. And it seemed a year or two later, uh, many of them couldn't quite remember the outcome document or said, well, they such a large document, they really had emphasized other pieces, not so much this one. Uh, or maybe there was unfinished work and that we had to re-debate the issues that we thought had been settled in 2005. Uh, so when uh, Ban Ki-moon came in as Secretary General, one of the things that he wanted to do uh, was to emphasize delivery uh, and, and deeds and not just promises. Uh, he really wanted to translate words such as the fine ones in the outcome document into operational policies for the organization. Uh, the problem was that uh, many member states were not so enthusiastic about that enterprise uh, and he asked me to undertake uh, a minor task of first trying to reconceptualize and reshape and redefine the debate uh, so we can move forward in a little more positive way and also have a more coherent idea of what we're talking about because many people were talking about quite different things when they talked about, if I can use the acronym, R2P. Uh, and there actually seemed to be something of a dialogue of the deaf, uh, people talking past each other uh, on this particular issue. Uh, second, he asked if I would work on the tools, uh, the operational plans, the institutional, uh, 
uh, remedies that would be necessary to actually uh, move this forward and begin to sketch out a strategy and a doctrine in that sense. And third, uh, try to make sure that uh, all 192 member states, or at least most of them, uh, were on board in the direction that he wanted to move. And, of course, the General Assembly, in its wisdom, decided that I could not have responsibility protecting my title because it was still uh, somewhat controversial. So my title is Special Advisor, period. So it could be for most anything, but it is largely on R2P. Uh, Second of all, they wisely decided I should have no compensation. And beyond that, I should have no staff. So other than that, we started off on a very, very strong basis uh, on this. And and I actually had a full-time job in in addition to this, which I fortunately have been able to retain. Uh, but I must say, it's, it's such a fascinating area. It's been, been quite, quite worth it. Um, and indeed, uh, we first had to work with the bureaucracy because the UN, as you know, is a very broad organization, does many, many different things. The right hand usually doesn't talk to the left hand unless by accident. Uh, and different people had very different conceptions. If you're in human rights, it looked like one kind of an issue. If you're in humanitarian affairs, it looked like a different one. Or in peacekeeping or political affairs or development or post-conflict a peace building, it looked different from all these perspectives. Uh, and for many of them, bureaucratically, it looked threatening because this is an issue that has a public constituency. There are NGOs, including active ones like the Global Center here in New York, and, and NGOs in several other parts of the world uh, dealing with R2P issues. It's the sort of thing a lot of Internet chatter, uh, particularly college students and others, about Darfur and other issues get quite activated uh, about this. Uh, so it was something that was potentially threatening because it actually had a political constituency, which is something the UN usually searches for and, and has a hard time finding. This one actually had one, but the UN needed some plan, some kind of doctrine uh, to, to respond to that. Uh, so we had a number of meetings uh, around the organization, uh, trying to bring the different uh, parts together, uh, and that took a bit of time. Uh, but I think in the end was was actually quite worthwhile because we learned from the different pieces of the UN why they saw it differently, uh, why they saw it either as supportive or or particularly, uh, in some cases, distracting uh, from their central mandates. Uh, So we were able to come up with a framework, a conceptual framework, that everyone in the system could sign off onto. And that then allowed the Secretary General to give his first major speech on this uh, uh, issue, which he did in Berlin uh, uh, back in last July. And I think it was quite striking. Our original idea was that he should give this in a developing country. Uh, but we wanted to do it before uh, the NAM uh, foreign ministers meeting, and, and the most likely candidate uh, was Germany. And then actually it didn't seem to be such a bad idea, because it wasn't a bad idea to remind people that this is not just an African problem, uh, that it can happen in upper income or mid- middle income uh, states as well as those that were destitute. Uh, that this is a global phenomenon and no part of the world is immune from it. Uh, So he gave his speech in July, and then we went about the task of trying to put together uh, a larger strategy and what ended up being a report uh, that was released this January. Meanwhile, trying to work with the member states and trying to understand what their concerns were. Uh, You would think preventing genocide, mass atrocities of one sort or another would be fairly natural. I mean, no state goes out and says, you know, today our plan is to destroy a portion of our population. Uh, Some of them do it, uh, but obviously it's not the sort of thing that they want to shout about. Uh, So why would it be controversial going forward with this? And we found there are very distinct concerns about sovereignty. Uh, There are very real concerns that somehow this really was simply uh, nicer words for the idea of humanitarian intervention of large states intervening in small states, uh, a lot of citations by many states of Iraq, and rather remember many, many uh, explanations for the intervention in Iraq. One, at one point, was for humanitarian reasons, so people thought, well, if this is what it is, uh, we're not very comfortable with it. Uh, A lot of complaints about decision-making. We kept saying it has to go through the charter, uh, through the uh, UN uh, intergovernmental bodies, but a lot of member states are very uncomfortable with the composition of the Security Council. Uh, and they didn't like that five countries had veto on this, and they felt the council was very selective. Uh, now, somehow we can't reform the charter, reform the Security Council based on R2P, but it is a continuing issue uh, that we have had to face. Uh, a lot of countries uh, felt that it was primarily military in nature uh, and was going to be an excuse for military action. Uh, so we had to show them that the UN has a broad, broad spectrum of ways of going about this, Uh, only one sliver of which is is through the military, that by the time you have to use the military, you probably have the bodies piled so high that you failed both in terms of policy and certainly had failed morally. Uh, We felt it was simply not a choice to say there's uh, 
some kind of a, a, a binary system here where either you do nothing and sit by or you send in the Marines. That simply was not satisfactory. We had to think of more nuanced ways of going about this. And first and foremost, we had to think about preventing these kinds of atrocities, not simply reacting uh, after the fact. Uh, so we went through very carefully the outcome document in 2005. There are two paragraphs on the subject, uh, very complicated paragraphs. I see uh, Amory Jones Perry, one of the people who gave us this complication in 2005. Uh, it was a nice compromise wording, but not always, frankly, the most obvious. Uh, in one case that we found particularly interesting, uh, the outcome document in 2005 was different than the way the General Assembly then adopted it uh, only uh, days later, because when it went through uh, that obscure part of the UN that actually tries to translate the things that diplomats have produced, they realized a critical statement had a verb tense that no one had ever heard of and didn't actually make sense. And this is one of the most important ones about when do you trigger uh, a response uh, and the way they translated it, uh, that when the authorities are manifestly failing to protect their populations. So this means if they are manifestly failing, it doesn't mean they have failed. One can move in early. So we always cite the General Assembly version of the document because it gives a verb tense that allows earlier action rather than the, the way it was agreed by the uh, diplomats uh, themselves. Um, so we went through the document word by word, phrase by phrase, and basically tried to deconstruct it uh, and figure out exactly what were they trying to say and how could we say it in a simpler way. And we said basically there are three pillars to this. The first and foremost is state responsibility. The international community cannot substitute for the state. The state has to be responsible. Uh, and we want to find examples where states are doing things, in fact, to make it less likely that these things will occur. It's often said that the most likely predictor of genocide is past genocide. I'm not sure that's always true, but there are these cycles of violence. We want to see what happens in the Rwandas and the Balkans and Cambodia and other places that have gone, th gone through this kind of trauma. What are they doing to make it less likely to happen again? The uh, second pillar is that of international assistance, uh, something that was rather new in the outcome document and very positive but spread in different phrases uh, throughout the document uh, is the idea of assisting and supporting and helping states uh, to meet these responsibilities. So we talk a lot about neighbors helping neighbors, and we talk about sub-regional and regional organizations. Uh, we talk about the possibility of targeted assistance, which would look at those things within societies that might make this uh, kind of trauma less likely, and assisting them. Uh, and above and beyond that, we said there may be actually military aspects of assistance. Uh, that, in fact, you look at a case, for example, uh, like Sierra Leone. It was not the government that was busy chopping off limbs, it was the RUF. Uh, so in our view, armed groups should have to live up to the same standards. And if a government cannot control its territory because of, uh, of armed groups, then in fact military assistance to that government uh, in fact can serve our 2P purposes. Uh, we also looked at the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, uh, which looked around at one point, saw the rest of its neighborhood in flames, and said we need an international force here in a preventive mode. Uh, so that we will not go that same kind of direction. So the preventive use of force, uh, or even Chapter 7 coercive measures that are designed to help the state vis-a-vis uh, -vis rebels groups may in fact be part of our assistance uh, pillar. And then finally comes the response pillar, the part is that is most controversial. And again, people thought of it as military, 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 and we said yes, there is an important role in some cases for the military, and at some points that should be used early rather than very, very late in the game. There may be extreme circumstances uh, where a very discreet and targeted use of military force earlier is helpful, but we think that's going to be rather rare. Uh, that in fact, in the large, large majority of cases, other kinds of measures under Chapter 6 in particular, uh, diplomacy. Uh, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, which many people had at the top of their list as a country most likely to go have another genocide, uh, when Juan Mendez was uh, a special advisor to the Secretary General, uh, for the prevention of genocide, he heard reports of incitement going on in Cote d'Ivoire. He visited, uh, he talked to the leadership, said, look, this is not right, uh, this could lead to very bad things, and remember there is the ICC, and impunity is not what it used to be, and you should pay attention. More recently in Kenya, uh, both Kofi Annan and the Secretary General, uh, when he visited, emphasized both to the opposition and to the President uh, that they seemed to be doing or encouraging incitement of violence based on 
uh, ethnicity and, and, and tribal origin. Uh, and if it wasn't ethnic cleansing, something close to ethnic cleansing was happening, and they should stop. And in each case, it did stop. The incitement stopped. It's something you can see, something you can hear, something you can do something about. Uh, it doesn't require any action by the Security Council. Uh, it doesn't require any military force. It just requires getting the message at the right time to the right people to cease and desist. And it can work. Uh, so there's a lot of things under diplomacy. There's lots of things under Chapter 8 in terms of working with regional and sub-regional organizations. The UN uh, almost always works in partnership these days, very rarely by itself. Uh, and we want to look at those kinds of things. Uh, so this has been a very broad kind of spectrum approach, and I think the member states are more comfortable with it. Uh, but we very often hear from them, gee, we like the report, but we're still a little bit uncomfortable with the concept. Uh, we're working forward on this. We hope we can have a debate in the General Assembly, having a little problem getting a date for it. Uh, but we hope by the uh, end of June or early July. And we're actually going to try to get a rather modest resolution, but one by consensus. Uh, they would put us back on track on this issue. And a year ago, people thought it was ridiculous to talk about consensus. Now it wouldn't be a perfect consensus, but we might be able to get something. It's largely procedural. It's largely to keep the debate going, but something that actually would put the Assembly on record uh, in favor of moving this forward at this point in time. Now let me just say a, a word about, about the EU. Uh, the EU has been enormously supportive and helpful on this. I must say, very, very consistent. Um, first of all, we see several roles uh, for the EU. One is on the second pillar that I mentioned, uh, targeted assistance of one sort or another. Uh, late last year, when the Irish uh, minister was giving his annual statement on development, he focused it on R2P, sort of retrospectively saying, well, we did this, that, and the other thing, and they must help in this regard. But that's the sort of thing we like to hear. And that's the sort of thing we want the developing world uh, to hear. Uh, second of all, there's been a lot of discussion uh, in the EU about rapid response. Uh, rapid response does not have to be military. Uh, it may be civilian or maybe some combination of the two. But rapid response is extremely important in these kinds of situations, and I think the EU is thinking very creatively about that, and we very much appreciate it. Uh, third, uh, we are looking to the EU for political support, and I think we're getting that political support. But we've tried very, very hard, and I think correctly, to stress that this is not a northern issue being pushed on the south. In many ways, it's a southern issue that rather late in the day uh, the north became aware of. Uh, the African Union and before that ECOWAS were well ahead on this issue uh, before the UN got involved, and even before uh, this famous ISIS panel that Gareth Evans and Mohamed Sanun headed the Canadian-backed one, had their report uh, in 2001. In year 2000, the uh, AU states had already negotiated their Constitutive Act which has a clause which looks very, very much like R2P Clause 4H uh, in that document. Uh, so we've asked the EU members to be rather quiet uh, and a lot of bilateral uh, um, interventions with various states, various states, and they've been doing that in a very helpful way, and we're very appreciative uh, of that. Uh, finally, uh, Ambassador Valenzuela uh, mentioned that this is a very difficult time because of the recession and uh, worse that we seem to be facing economically. Uh, and that perhaps for human rights this is going to be a fairly trying time. Uh, I think there's a lot to what he says, but in a way it seems to me this is a time we really have to redouble our efforts on human rights generally and on R2P issues in particular, because this is a kind of time where the competition over resources could pit group against group. It's a kind of time where governments that are failing to provide uh, the kinds of resources, the kinds of welfare, uh, the, the kind of prosperity that their uh, citizens want can easily point to particular groups and blame those groups. And we've seen that history in the past. Very often there's some kind of an economic uh, competition uh, which has something to do with the human rights problems, which has something to do with uh, uh, pointing to certain minorities and others as the problem. Uh, so we think it's a time that we should look at these kinds of targeted measures uh, in, in an economic and political and social sense within societies because they don't have to be enormously expensive. They can be a rather small part uh, of a development budget, but they can be a very significant part. Uh, the Ambassador of Rwanda often complains that after their uh, horrific genocide in 1994, uh, they couldn't get the kind of modest support that they needed to put the things in place uh, in their society because the donors had very uh, template uh, uh, defined ways of going about development, and these kinds of issues just didn't fit 
uh, their their sense of going about this. Uh, I'm going to Kigali this weekend, and we're trying to find out more about their experience there. Uh, but we do hope and assume that our friends in the EU will begin to think about this, and in fact, continue to think about this in very creative ways. Because one of the things we know about this area, one, it's terribly, terribly important, uh, but two, we don't have the answers. Uh, we're just beginning to understand how these things work. And uh, the more we can dialogue with the member states, the more we can uh, dialogue with uh, independent groups in civil society, the more likely we are to come up with some answers that actually might have some staying power and make some difference. So thank you for your patience. And I, I think our two topics actually do connect. So thank you. We've heard two views, one from a perspective of Europe and looking out from Europe toward the world, and the other from the perspective of the uh, United Nations on human rights. Uh, both of them seem to be moderately optimistic. I must confess I don't share that optimism. I do share the passion for human rights and the convictions of the other speakers, but I think the record is uh, not encouraging that even at the level of the universality of human rights, the prescriptive or lawmaking level, we still face major challenges. It's very easy and was very easy for the General Assembly in the period between 1945 and 1950, when it was dominated by the United States and largely Western states, to pass the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to call it universal. And the rights were certainly universal in the sense that they could be applied to any man, woman, or child without reference to their religion, their membership in a real or consang uh, fictitious blood community. They were truly universal. But were they universally accepted? Are they universally accepted now? Are they universally accepted in the Middle East? Is there universal acceptance of the notion that women are equal and are entitled to all of the indulgences that men are entitled to? Is there a universal agreement on the freedom of religion? I think we have certainly appropriated the word universal, but I'm not sure that the battle for actually installing a universally accepted conception of human dignity has yet been won. Nor am I certain and, and am I so optimistic with respect to the implementation of human rights. Pete spoke about the Human Rights Council and the fact that the United States has rejoined it. We all know the sad story of the Human Rights Commission and why it had to be changed because it was almost an embarrassment from the perspective of anyone concerned with human rights. But the Human Rights Council, until now, has not performed much better. The fact of the matter is that the great instruments of human rights that Pete referred to, and that I think were the predicate of Ed's discussion, were installed by the United Nations and could not have become part of the architecture of international politics without the United Nations. But can the United Nations a body made up of governments, all of which to some degree or other are very jealous of their sovereign powers, can it be counted upon to enforce human rights in particular cases? Can it be counted upon to prevent? Can it be counted on to stop ongoing human rights violations? I think the record to date is not particularly encouraging. I would suggest particularly to the younger people in the audience that in the 21st century the implementation of the human rights which have been prescribed by the United Nations will turn increasingly to the activities of civil society who will invoke who will insist upon compliance operating through the democratic governments where, where they exist I think it would be a mistake for us to identify the implementation of human rights with the United Nations, the fit there, in my view, is not very good. We have reserved some time for questions from the audience, and uh, I'd like to invite them at this moment. Yes, in the back, please. <laughs> 
Um, uh, good questions, as, as always. Uh, and if I could respond a little bit to Michael's comments a, a, as well, which uh, I think were um, important comments. Um, one to, to Michael. Um, I mean, I think one has to be a little bit optimistic in this business, uh, whether the business is international law, international organization, human rights, or whatever. Um, and I think one has to take a historic perspective. Uh, these things don't happen in linear fashion. Uh, they um, do not happen in universal grand gestures. Um, they happen over decades. Uh, they happen in capitals. They happen in villages. Uh, they happen in the way people view values, um, the way governments make choices. Um, and I would never suggest that the UN, uh, in an operational sense, would be first and foremost in these areas, but I do think it is first and foremost in building the norms and codifying the norms, and I think that's extremely important over time. I happen to be, as a, I hate to say political scientist, but I guess that's what I'm accused of being sometimes, a constructivist, and I do believe that values are enormously important. The national interest has very little meaning other than what political figures interpret them to be, and, and in some societies, uh, why people choose those political leaders rather than others. Um, and I do think, uh, if you look over time, human rights have changed and have improved. And I, I think the, the very fact that people are trying, I think, is extremely important. And I, I think we have to, you know, not take snapshots of how things look today, but rather, you know, recognize these are rather dynamic processes. And were they better 10 years ago or 20 years ago? It's certainly an R2P kinds of issues. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, there wouldn't have been nearly the outcry, or nearly the efforts to try to do things like uh, in Darfur. If you compare Rwanda, there's, you know, an effort to deny uh, what was happening. Within the Secretariat itself, the effort was to block the information coming to the top, uh, not to encourage it. Uh, many Security Council members discouraged those smaller members of the Council who wanted to do something about it because it was inconvenient uh, uh, for them, unfortunately, uh, including my own country, the United States. Um, and on enforcing human rights, um, I think, you know, it's, it's maybe not the best term, enforcement. Uh, I think human rights, in some ways, are going to have to be sort of self-enforcing over time uh, you're not going to have a huge enforcement regime under Chapter 7 that's going to go in and, and uh, change these things. Uh, because, I, again, I think the UN's role really is very much the normative role. And it's a unique role because it's the only place where everyone gets together. Um, and uh, that, I think, is extremely important to, to all of this. Uh, on the question of Sri Lanka, um, one, l let me um, make clear that my job description does not include investigating and commenting on individual circumstances. Uh, with my vast staff and, and, and whatever, I, I have no, no independent information of what's going on in Sri Lanka, quite frankly. Um, um, but let me say a couple comments on it. Uh, one, um, uh, I think many people see Sri Lanka as an R2P situation at this point. Um, for example, recently the Indian uh, foreign minister commented, I think it was about two weeks ago, um, that uh, the government of Sri Lanka has a responsibility to protect those civilians caught in, in, in the crossfire there. Um, and as you know, India was not the first to get on board in 2005. It was actually the last to get on board among the member states. So I think it's quite significant uh, that the Indian foreign minister used responsibility to protect language. I, I asked Indian diplomats about this, and they said, yes, it was quite purposeful. They felt it was an appropriate circumstance for that. Uh, I would go a step farther. They also made comment about LTTE uh, in their statement. Uh, as I suggested before, even though um, uh, uh, armed groups are obviously were not party to the uh, outcome document or to international conventions, uh, we think they should be held to the same standards. So both the LTTE and the government should, in fact, be doing all they can to protect the people there. You asked whether the Secretary General should travel there. Uh, I, I don't do his travel itinerary. I, I, I don't, frankly, see the point. Uh, as you know, John Holmes has been there, uh, the, the uh, emergency relief coordinator and head of, head of OCHA. Uh, the chef de cabinet, uh, Nambiar, uh, Vijay Nambiar, <coughs> was there recently. Uh, there have been a lot of high-level uh, UN personalities who have gone <coughs> there and tried to make the case. Uh, and I, I think the parties probably understand what the international community is thinking uh, in this regard. Um, but I think we have to try to hold both sides uh, accountable uh, in, in that regard. Um, if I could 
cited another case which was not an R2P case, and I, I argued at the time that it was not, made myself unpopular, at least with one member state. Uh, the, the case of um, uh, the uh, uh, Cyclone Nargis uh, in Myanmar, you know, we did not see it as an R2P situation, but it was a situation where the Secretary General did go, uh, and I think he did ha- help to nudge the door open a bit there. And I think he felt particularly as the first Asian Secretary General in, in 35 years uh, that he could particularly contribute to, to the dialogue there. And I, I think that was a very appropriate use. Uh, as I said, uh, in the case of Kenya, which was the only case that the UN has officially applied R2P as its overarching strategy, the Secretary General did go there. He went first to Addis Ababa and talked about R2P to a summit. Of, of the AU, and then went into uh, Nairobi and, and talked to both sides about this. And then when he came back, he talked to the Security Council about the R2P uh, issues uh, in, in Kenya. So I do think there's a role. And, and again, uh, in both cases, it was not because the Security Council asked him to. Uh, he did it because he thought it was a wise thing to do, uh, and the member states did not object and found that to be useful. But I think you can overuse his good offices. and. Uh, as you know, he uh, is getting a lot of frequent flyer miles, as it is, as someone who is uh, peripatetic in terms of his, his travel. Pete? Um, thank you very much. I, I would like to echo very much the uh, remarks that uh, Ed Luck made on uh, Sri Lanka. Um, both EU countries uh, individually and collectively have pressed for a pause in the fighting um, in Sri Lanka. There's a uh, a war going on between the government and, and the LTTE, and um, the L- there's, there's no there's sympathy whatsoever for the LTTE, but still we press on the government of Sri Lanka to follow international unitarian law. Um, and the overall goal is to minimize um, human suffering. I think, though, that one should make a distinction between um, um, human rights and and implementing human rights and this sort of crisis situation. In principle, there is a link um, in a number of EU agreements between um, preferential trade um, positions and and, and, uh, human rights um, behavior, but I don't think it it, uh, is really uh, applicable to this sort of situations, uh, both in terms of the time frame and in terms of this sort of situation that is there's a lot to be said about uh, uh, the human rights situation in Sri Lanka but this particular situation is not the prime example of of, um, of um, applying the yardstick for uh, how well human rights are implemented in, in Sri Lanka um, with regard to what Michael said I, I think it's very important what you said uh, I, I would like to re-emphasize this more optimistic uh, outlook um, that I gave in the beginning um, I do not agree that uh, the, the, the story of the Commission on Human Rights is a sad story I don't think it's a sad story because at one point or other there was a Libyan chair I, I don't think it's a sad story because at some point or other there were resolutions adopted that the Netherlands in the first place uh, disagreed very strongly with against Israel. I think on the whole, um, the body of work that was constructed by the Commission on Human Rights is very impressive, as I said in the beginning, and I would um, like to continue that discussion. But, but you, you raised a number of uh, important points, that there are challenges, and, and what Ed said um, earlier, that um, implementation of, of um, social economic rights, especially in times of crisis, is, is double important. And, and in most of the um, treaties that have been agreed upon in uh, UN context uh, are relatively vague on how precisely um, these, how, uh, how people are entitled to these rights. Um, and there's a lot of leeway, national leeway for implementing these rights, but that they will be under stress in times of crisis is, uh, is, is clear, and that requires a double effort. Thank you. Relative to the problems they face, um, what, what do you think the possibilities are that African countries might sue countries, including EU countries and perhaps the United States, to get more funding to deal with uh, climate risks? And do so on the grounds of human rights. <coughs> do you think uh, uh, sometimes I think uh, it's a blessing that I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, uh, and, and 
Uh, I don't think how that suing uh, would work. Uh, clearly, um, we have uh, a common responsibility, a common but differentiated, as we say, in the climate change uh, uh, lingo, um, to avert uh, climate change, at least um, to the extent that we can. And it's also clear to me that there are links between the climate change um, um, broad issue uh, and and human rights, and that you have um, climate refugees and that people's uh, living uh, are being influenced by changes in, in, in global or regional or local uh, climate. Um, but um, I, I don't see how that... Um, uh, how such uh, suing would work as you have presented it. If I could just make a small comment, it wasn't quite your question, but there are those uh, among the R2P advocates who would like it to apply to things like climate change and HIV, AIDS, and many other things, and, and we resist that very, very strongly. Uh, sometimes your, your best friends can be your worst enemies politically. And um, in, in this case, uh, the heads of state and government agreed only to four crimes and violations, genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity. And I know if we were to move an inch beyond that, uh, we would lose a lot of member states very quickly. So we keep saying that our approach is narrow but deep. It's narrow in terms of uh, the number of cases that we're looking at, but very deep in terms of the number of ways that one might go about trying to make a difference. Uh, as you know, there's a, a hallowed tradition around the UN to take very simple, straightforward ideas and make them into absolute mush as they try to apply to everything. And we're trying our best to, to resist that uh, temptation. One last question. Yes, please. Miss. First of all, when we speak about a common uh, European human rights policy as part of the common uh, EU foreign policy, then we mean external policy. Um, so that common EU human rights policy has no direct bearings on um, implementation of human rights in Hungary. Um, the body that has done um, much, uh, has focused um, on, on this sort of minority problems is um, the uh, Council of Europe. Um, and there are specific uh, treaties on the protection of minorities uh, agreed in that context. Um, I know that um, there has been uh, quite a lot of attention to uh, protection of Romas and, and, and violations of human rights, um, but I, I can't speak to the details uh, of that. Um, clearly, uh, protection of minorities belongs to the, the, the heart of uh, human rights issues, even though um, it's couched in somewhat different ways in terms of minorities instead of individual uh, human rights. Um, but again, I, I can't speak, uh, nor am I as a Dutch diplomat, um, would it make much sense to speak out here on, on, uh, uh, on, on human rights in Hungary. Thank you. I'm sure there are many other questions that have to be asked, but we have a responsibility to protect the time allotted to the next panel. <laughs> I thank the speakers very much for their provocative statements, and thank you for the questions. <laughs>